As we begin the lesson for this evening, I'll thank Brother Dan for leading that song because the words of that song are taken pretty much directly, I guess it would depend on your translation, but almost directly word for word from the 51st Psalm. And that's what our lesson tonight is going to center around. I've titled it The Art of Confession, but if you look at the 51st Psalm, and you want, might want to go ahead and keep a bookmark there, or your finger in that page, because we're going to keep coming back to it. We're not going to read the entirety of it right now, but if you look at it, I believe all of our Bibles have a note at the beginning. We know the book of Psalms, the various uh, poems that were written by a number of different individuals. About half of them maybe were written by David, and we're told that this psalm in particular was not only written by David, that he was the author, but we're told when and why it was written. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So we know what this psalm is talking about. And we won't rehash the details of the story. We're all familiar with the sin that he committed with this woman and then subsequently with her husband having him killed. And then Nathan the prophet comes in and basically tells him a parable for David to understand the seriousness of his sin. And when Nathan tells him, you are the man, that realization sinks in. And David immediately understands and knows what he has done, and we see that he repents. But the <coughs> historical account that we have for us is back in 2 Samuel. While that tells you know, the bare-bones facts of what happened, this psalm is David pouring out his heart from his perspective. Now that it's all said and done, looking back at what he has done, it's him <coughs> confessing that sin to God and repenting of it. And we want to talk about this because confession is kind of a, a funny thing in the religious world today. There are so many groups and denominations who have their own ideas as to what confession is or should be. People think that you need to list off everything you've done over the last few days, something like that. But if what we look at in this psalm is any indication, God doesn't need for us to give him a laundry list of the things that we have done or said or left undone or left unsaid because throughout this David never uses the term adultery or fornication or murder. He doesn't specify which sins he's committed. It is enough that he is confessing that he has sinned and that's the real point here. And so like I said in the religious world today we might have our own preconceived notions as to what confession is or things that we've heard it to be but then there's the biblical truth about what confession is. And maybe we get sidetracked for us today in the Lord's Church that we think that, well, because so many people paint it in such and such a way that therefore confession is not important. When nothing could be further from the truth. Confession is, as we go through this lesson, we'll see absolutely necessary when it comes to the idea of repenting of sin that we have committed in our lives. It doesn't matter whether it's a sin of commission or a sin of omission doesn't matter. You know, we might look at our lives, look at ourselves and say, well, I've never done anything as bad as what David did with, with Bathsheba and Uriah and, and the conspiring and all that. It doesn't matter because we know God doesn't see big sins, little sins. He doesn't categorize things like that. So whatever it is that we have done, or like I said before, perhaps left undone when we should have acted in our lives, something we need to repent of, we have to understand the role that confession plays in that. And like I said, we're going to be looking through the psalm to see the, the example that David sets for us and the, the clear progression of what we're seeing here. We see, first of all, there is an appeal to God's mercy and love. As the song we sang, like I said, taken almost word for word from this psalm, you see many of the psalms are basically prayers that are put in this poetic language. They are addressed directly to God, and that's what we see. The first verse says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. So, as David begins here his prayer, 
He's making it clear whom he's talking to. He's talking to the Lord. And he's asking God to have mercy on him. He's making an appeal. Please, please, have mercy on me. And he says, according to your steadfast love, your abundant mercy. So not only is he praying to God and he's asking for mercy, but he's recognizing the fact that with God, the love that he has, the love that he shows, the mercy that he has, they know no bounds. There are no limits to them. It's not that God will forgive only up to a certain point. David here is recognizing that God is, he is love. That God is steadfast. That God is merciful. That God is willing to do this. And this point becomes especially interesting when we consider the time which, in which David lived. He lived and died under the law of Moses. But there's no forgiveness of sins under the Mosaic law. No, there wasn't. In the law that the children of Israel received there on Mount Sinai, the law that they were still under while David ruled as king, when all these things took place, there was nothing that said, if you do X, Y, and Z, then God will forgive your sins. None of it. But David still, as he addresses God, asks for mercy and makes an appeal to God's love. That tells us that even though it wasn't explicitly written down in the law that forgiveness was available, that David knew the character of God. He knew that God is a loving God, a forgiving God. Again, so many people in the world try to say that there's a, a huge contrast between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. The God of the Old Testament is all fire and brimstone and striking people down, and then the New is all love and peace and forgiveness. God has always been love and peaceful and forgiving. Just because we see His anger, just because we see His jealousy and His wrath, doesn't make any of the other things go away. So David knew who God was. He had a good relationship with God. And of course, David, in saying this, also recognizes that forgiveness doesn't come from us. It comes from God. We talk about mercy. We often contrast mercy and grace because grace, as we always define it, is unmerited favor. It's something good that we don't deserve. Mercy would be the exact opposite. It's having something bad withheld from us, having that punishment withheld, even though we deserve every last bit of it. So it's not that David deserved to be forgiven, and it's not that he didn't deserve to be punished for what he had done. He absolutely deserved it. He had taken this woman that he had no right to. He had conspired, had her husband killed, and in his conspiring to do so, put basically his blood not only on David's head, but on the head of all those other men who were party to it. Everything that he had done, David deserved whatever would be coming to him. But he appeals to the mercies of the Lord. God is merciful, even though we deserve punishment. We deserve to pay for our sins. God is merciful. He offers that mercy, especially to us today, living under the new law. We deserve to pay for our sins that we've done. But Jesus paid the price for us. Over in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 highlights this fact. Starting there with verse 4, it says, But when the goodness... And loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And there's any number of other passages we could go to that will tell us the exact same thing. The hope that we have, the forgiveness that we have, it's not earned. And it's nothing that we deserve. It is a gift from God. Not because of anything we've done, not because we have earned it. There are no works we could ever accomplish that would ever be good enough. Despite what so many people might try to say about the Lord's church, we don't teach that people are saved by works. 
If we taught that, we'd be teaching exactly against what God's word is telling us. No. It's according to God's grace. It's according to his mercy. Because he loves us. Because he doesn't want to see us lost. Now we can still be lost. We can still face the punishment, the consequences for our sins if we reject his mercies. But he's made it very clear. If we make an appeal to him, us now today through Christ, he's ready and willing to forgive our sins. So when it comes to us in our lives, whatever it is that we have done, or not done. When we realize and we are convicted of our sin, the very first thing we need to do is make an appeal to God. Pray to Him on the basis that He is a loving God, that He is merciful, that we know He is not only able to forgive our sins, but that He wants to forgive our sins. And One of the other good examples for this is the example that Jesus gave over in Luke chapter 18 where he made a contrast between two men who went up to pray. There in Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 9, it says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you, that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. It's one of the shortest prayers on record, I believe. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Seven words long, but it says so much about the kind of heart that this man had, about the way he thought of God. He wasn't going to stand there and tell God about all the things that he's been doing, talk about how great he is. But in his prayer, he recognizes God's power, God's authority, and he recognizes God's mercy. If he thought God was this hateful, intolerant God who just strikes everybody dead, the way a lot of critics of religion and critics of the Bible try to paint God, why would he ask for mercy? The fact that he's asking for mercy at all shows he believes that God is merciful. We have to believe it. If we don't believe it, then why would we pray that? If you don't believe that God is merciful, you ask Him for mercy, you're wasting your breath. We don't ask for things that we think are impossible. We don't ask for things that we don't think there's any chance would ever happen. When we pray to God, we have to know and believe that He is loving, that He is merciful. And that's what we're counting on. Because that's what would take away our sin. We also see that, getting down to the bare bones of what confession is, David acknowledges his sin. It's not enough that he goes to God and asks for forgiveness, that he, he throws himself on God's mercy. But he says outright that he has sinned and now is telling God, He's not going to try to hide it anymore. He tried to hide it a great bit with Bathsheba. He brought Uriah in to maybe think that the baby would be his. And then when that didn't work, he had to have Uriah killed. And then maybe no one would, would know about it. He tried to hide it before. And that clearly didn't work. Look at what he says in verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 51. He says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And we'll get more to verse 4 here in a second. But the fact that David, again, says here, I've sinned. He says, I know my transgression. 
I know what I've done. And again, contrary to the popular religious teaching of the day, he doesn't have to spell it out. God already knows when we pray to him. We don't have to give him this list of all the things that we've done. So David, as he's confessing, he doesn't name adultery. He doesn't name lying and murder. Because he doesn't have to. He says, I know my transgression. My sin is ever before me. If we were to put that into our own words today, we would probably say something to the effect of, I can't get it off my mind. My sin is ever before me. It was eating away at David, knowing what he had done. Knowing that he was guilty. There's no debating this. There's no ifs. There's no trying to justify it. He had sinned with Bathsheba. He had sinned by trying to cover it up and lie about it. He would sinned by murdering Uriah. And then going on pretending like nothing was wrong until Nathan the prophet came along to shake some sense into it. My sin is ever before me. So he's telling God, I admit to what I've done. I have sinned against you. There's no hiding it. And not only is he admitting the fact that there's no hiding it, he's telling God, I'm not going to try. It is ever before me. I'm not going to try to cover this up. I'm not going to try to, to justify it. And that takes some courage to acknowledge, to admit that we have sinned. Usually the first thing we do is try to blame someone else. It's the oldest trick in the book, right? We see it back in the Garden of Eden. Well, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave to me and I ate. Well, this serpent deceived me. David doesn't do that here. I have sinned. He's taking responsibility for what he's done. Do we do the same thing in our lives? When we know that we've said something we shouldn't have said, that we've acted in a way that is unbecoming of a child of God, do we admit that it's our fault? We're the ones who are guilty of that sin, and we confess to God, I've transgressed your law. I have violated your commandments. And like I said, we get back to verse 4 in a second. I want to spend some time talking about that because when you look at Psalm 51, verse 4, just kind of at face value, you might scratch your head and think, well, that's not right. Because David said, against you, you only, have I sinned. He didn't only sin against God. He sinned against Bathsheba in getting her to commit adultery with him. Now, we're not recorded where she ever tried to resist him or turn him down, but still, he sinned against her. He very clearly sinned against Uriah, and he sinned against all the other servants, Joab included, all the in-between people who had knowledge and had a hand in killing him. David had wronged all of those people. So what does he mean that he had only sinned against God? Is he trying to say it doesn't matter? No. He's not trying to make light of any of that. From his language and how penitent he is, we know that's not the case. Look over in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, we have recorded for us the account of Ananias and Sapphira. It says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. It's kind of the same thing here. We look at what Peter says and say, he's lied to men. When he lays it at their feet and tells them that he sold it for that price, as his wife would later, they're lying right to their faces. And not only are they lying to the apostles there directly, but to anyone and everyone else who would see their gift. Of course, that was their intention. That people would see it and think, oh, how generous they are that they sold their land and brought all the proceeds. It's lying by deception. 
So he's clearly lied to a lot of people, yet Peter says, you've not lied to men, but to God. Why? Well, for the same reason of what David says here. Against you, you only have I sinned. It's not to say that he hasn't wronged anyone else. And it's not to make light of it. It's recognizing the fact that God comes first. When we do something wrong, a lot of times it does hurt other people around us. Sometimes we hurt the ones we we love the most. And that being the case, we need to admit that we're wrong. We need to apologize to them. We need to ask for their forgiveness. But when it comes to sin, they come second. If we are Christians, then God has to be our first priority. He's our creator. He is our heavenly father. It's his commandment that we've broken. You know, even if someone were to go out and kill someone else, they've committed murder. That's a crime, according to our government. But more importantly, that they've committed a crime, broken one of man's laws and hurt the family of the person who is now gone. They violated God's laws. He has to come first. So while we keep in mind everyone else and understand that there are earthly consequences to sin even if we have forgiveness from God, our first priority, first reaction has to be acknowledging I've went against God. He told me exactly what to do. I didn't do it. He said exactly what not to do, and that's the very thing. I just went and did. It's against God that we have sinned. If we repent, if we confess, just because we got caught, just because it makes our family look bad, or any other reason, how much does that matter? We have to acknowledge our state before God and say it is before Him. It is against Him that we've sinned. Because in the end, that's what matters the most. And when we do that, for us today, making application, that's how we receive His grace. A lot of you have probably been waiting for when we would go over to 1 John. That time is now. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, says, If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light, or, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you read this passage, there's two things that you need to zero in on. The first is the amazing amount of times you see the word if. It's conditional here. If we walk in that. We have choice. We have free will. We can walk in the light, we can be in a right relationship with God, or we cannot be. A lot of people have this idea that if you become a Christian, that if you accept Jesus into your heart, the way a lot of people want to put it, then you're good from that point on. Once saved, always saved kind of doctrine. And you're fine. But he's using the word if here. It's conditional, based on our lives our hearts, our attitudes. The second thing you want to zero in on, and perhaps more important, that's debatable, is the fact that he is using the pronouns we and us. He's not talking here about people who need to come to the Lord. He's not talking about people who are away from God and need to obey the gospel. Remember, of course, this is the Apostle John writing. And he's writing to fellow Christians. So he's talking about people who have been baptized. They've had their sins forgiven. If we say we have no sin, there's your concrete proof that just because a person is a Christian, 
That doesn't mean they're immune from temptation. It doesn't mean that they won't sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Yes, after we come to Christ, we can still sin. And we can be found guilty of that sin. But we have the option to confess those sins, what we're talking about tonight, repenting of them. And it says He'll forgive us. His forgiveness is still there. It's not a one-time thing. It is continually available. But it is dependent on us going to God, confessing our sins to Him. We have to do it. It is absolutely necessary in order to receive the grace that God is offering. And look at the alternative. Keep reading there in verse 10 of 1 John, the last verse of the chapter. He says, If... We say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. If we try to deny it, say that we haven't sinned, that we're not guilty, it's somebody else's fault, his word isn't in us. We're calling God a liar because he tells us directly in his word, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We always want to think that we're good. If something goes wrong, it's not our fault. There's always someone else to blame. But we know it's not the truth. We need to confess our sins to God. We need to be repenting to Him when we err. There's just no getting around it. It is absolutely necessary to be found right in His sight, to be cleansed, as it says, from all unrighteousness. But, we know, the psalm doesn't end there. After making his appeal to God, after admitting what he's done, confessing that he has sinned, that he is guilty, and it is against God first and foremost that he's done this, We see that David prayed for restoration. He wanted to be brought back. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. God wants us to be restored. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read from this chapter this morning, looking a little further down, starting with verse 18. It says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And we've talked about this at length before. That being reconciled means being brought back to where you once were, to where you need to be. And of course, What we're looking at here are those who have never obeyed the gospel, coming to Christ, being brought back to God. But the same thought still applies. For one who is a Christian and yet has sinned, has wandered away from the Lord, they can be restored. They can be brought back. It's not that their sin makes them somehow cease to be a Christian. No, they're still a child of God. They're an erring child. They're in a dangerous state. They're still his child, but they need to be restored. They need to be back with God. We have to be in that right relationship with him where we can draw near to him. And we can't draw near to him if we have sin in our lives because God is pure. God is holy. And if we have sin, we can't draw near to him. It just doesn't work. Going back again to Psalm 51, As David in verses 10 and 12 says this. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. 
Now, you might think that we're kind of repeating ourselves here, that there's a lot of overlap. Well, he's already asked for forgiveness. He'd already asked for God to show him mercy. So why is he asking us here? Because there's more to it than that. He's asking that he be forgiven, yes. But now he's asking that God restore him to where he used to be. To mend that relationship, to bring it back to what it once was. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Let me be your servant again. That's what I want. It's not enough that I don't have these sins. It's not enough that I, I don't have these sins counted against me. Yeah, I want that guilt. I want that gone. But I want more than that. When we pray to God and we repent, we confess our sins, we admit our faults, we should be asking for restoration. Lead me back. Bring me back to where I need to be to serve you, to please you. And as I said, it's more than forgiveness of that current transgression. It goes beyond the simple idea of, well, I, I sinned today. I, I mistreated someone. I wasn't the kind of individual, I wasn't the, the Christian I should have been. It's more than just asking forgiveness for that one sin or whatever it is. It's wanting to be better. And the way David worded it there, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Perhaps that's a part of this that we need to be reminded of. That's something that maybe after we have obeyed the gospel, after you've been a Christian for a while, you, you tend to, to forget. We're so caught up by the, the things in this life that we, we overlook it, but the idea that salvation from God, being saved from those sins, being in that right relationship with Him is something that we should rejoice over. That's something we need to remember. Something we need to keep in mind. And that's, you know, again, what David is, is asking for here. Take me from where I am, in my guilt, in my sorrow, and bring me back to that place of joy, knowing that I have salvation that comes from the Lord. One of the clearest examples of this is what we see in Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It says there in verse 36, And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. How good it felt to know his sins were gone. They were remitted, blotted out. They didn't exist anymore. Now he was in a right relationship with God. We should long for that joy. If we don't feel it anymore, why not? What's the reason where we've grown cold on that? That's what we should want. And that's what we should pray for when we pray to God, repenting, confessing what we've done. That we should pray that we be restored back to where we need to be. Back where we should have been all along. But one last thing before we bring the lesson to a close is we see that in addition to confessing, admitting that he was wrong, in addition to repenting to God, asking for his, his mercy, throwing himself on God's love, and wanting to be restored, David now turns the prayer kind of to himself. And he resolves to offer service to the Lord. Not just any service, mind you. Grateful service. Grateful that he can serve such a wonderful, magnificent God. Grateful that God is loving and forgiving. That he offers forgiveness of sins. You look at verses 13 through 15. He says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. 
Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. This, as we can read in the scriptures, this is what true repentance is. It shows fruit. It bears fruit. We can read in the New Testament about earthly sorrow, carnal sorrow versus godly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And true repentance, not just being sorry that we got caught, not just being sorry that there's consequences for our actions, being truly sorry, understanding the wrong that we've done. We don't just say, I'm sorry. We do something about it. We bear fruit keeping with that repentance. And again, just to look at this on the surface, someone might look at this and say that, well, David is, is making a deal with God here. He's saying, God, if you'll forgive me, if you'll restore me, if you, if you do all this, then I'll teach transgressors your ways. David's not trying to bargain with God and making an if-then statement. If you'll do this, then I will. Because... Very different from where we read in the New Testament. You don't see the word if here. He doesn't say, if you will, then I will. He is simply asking God to forgive him. He doesn't say if because he trusts that God will. It shows the faith that he has. And what he's saying here of I will teach transgressors your ways. And I will sing aloud of your righteousness. My mouth will declare your praise. He's not saying... I'm going to do this, but only on the condition that you... He's saying, I'm going to do this because I know it's what I need to do. And he's saying he'll do this because he'll be in, a be in the best possible condition to do it. Who better to talk to people about God's love and his forgiveness than someone who has been forgiven of so much, like David? We can say the same thing of Paul in the New Testament. Who better to try to convince people about the gospel, about Jesus, about how amazing it is than this man who was an avid persecutor, who had sent people to prison, had them killed. And yet look at the difference it made in his life. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians 7, the passage I referenced to just a second ago, says in verse 9, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas godly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. And of course, he's writing to the church in Corinth because of the repenting they needed to do because of all the problems they have that we see in the first letter to the Corinthians. He says they were... They were pricked to a godly sorrow that led to repentance. He says that leads to salvation. He says, look at the earnestness that it produced in you. It lit a fire under them when they heard all the things that Paul was telling them. I can't believe that this is going on in the church. The division, the abuse of the Lord's Supper, the man who had his father's wife. They showed fruit. They resolved to not just repent of that, they resolve to offer service, to be better. That's what we have to do. Not enough that we own up to what we've done. It's not enough to just ask God to forgive us. We need to do that because we should know that He can and that He will. But we have to say, I'm going to tell others what I've done what I've learned, how I've grown through this. I'm going to tell others that my God is a loving God, a forgiving God. And really, 
simplest way I know to make this point is that we can say, well, yeah, I, I sinned, but I asked God to forgive me of that. We can say that all we like. Our words don't mean much when we don't back them up with anything. But if others can see in our lives the change and how after sin, how much we rededicate ourselves to following God and pleasing Him, that might mean all the world to them. To be not only encouraged by our example, but to do the same thing in their lives. Over in 1 John chapter 3, the point is made here. He says in verse 16, By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So if we're going to repent, if we're going to pray to God, confessing our sins, asking Him to forgive us, it needs to be more than just word and talk. It needs to be repentance that produces a change in our lives. That we don't just settle for going to God and asking Him to forgive us. We resolve to do something about it. If we're willing to admit that I'm the one who's sinned and fallen short of God, then it shouldn't be that much of a stretch for us to say that I can and will do better. That I'm going to learn from my mistakes. That I'm not going to do this again. And as we've said, despite what so many in the religious world might think, confession, it's not regulated or overseen by, by men. There's no set rules for it. It's between the individual and God. What we saw there was David going to God, praying to Him, pouring his heart out over the sin that he had committed. But just because it's not something that we have a strict regulation on doesn't mean it's not important. If you have sinned in your life, then as part of making that right, you need to go to God in prayer. You need to confess that sin. You need to repent of it. Asking for His forgiveness. Just as we saw David do it. We can't neglect that in our lives today. We have to admit when we're wrong, not just to others around us, but most importantly to God. We need to learn from David's example. We see the sin that he committed, the sin that goes down in history. Pretty much everybody knows about it. But what else is said of David? He was a man after God's own heart. He was penitent. He knew what he had done was wrong. He admitted it. He confessed it. He prayed to God. The same God that we can serve and should serve faithfully today. If you are outside of the body of Christ, if you have never been obedient to the gospel, we read earlier in Acts chapter 8 of the Ethiopian eunuch. He was taught by Philip. Philip preached to him Jesus, starting from all the way back in Isaiah. And he understood what had to be done. We're not told how long they traveled in that chariot, but it doesn't seem like it was all that long few hours at the most. And he knew what he needed to do. And he even asked him, what prevents me? What hinders me? Why can't we do this now? If you're outside of Christ, you need to have your sins forgiven because you're still separated from God. We have time and opportunity to do that this evening. If you believe, if you're willing to repent, to confess that He is the Son of God, you can be immersed in water. You can become a Christian. But if you have done so, if you have once dedicated your life to following Him and you have stumbled, you have sinned. Like we said, none of us are immune from it. None of us are perfect. You have time and opportunity now to do something about it. To make it right. Confess that to God. Ask for His forgiveness. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. 
If you have spiritual needs this evening, would you please come have a seat on the front? Together stand, we'll sing.